So part of the goal with this video is to um, get some background information, some context, because the our understanding or theory of the atom has grown tremendously over the years and it continues to grow to this day. So I'm going to try and be clear as to what is just way back in history that we don't need to worry about for this course for moving ahead and what are the things that we do need to, to know and do need to be able to work with in terms of this course. So. I'll tell you what you do and what you don't need to know. When we talk about things that we know, there's really two different ways that we can define it, or two different types of knowledge, if we put that in quotation marks. There are things that I can look at and I can see and I can know that they're true because they're right there in front of me. So for example, the, these things, but again, you could come up with all kinds of other examples. And then there's theoretical knowledge. And with theoretical knowledge, people love to say, oh, it's just a theory. But the reality is, the reality is, there are things that work and we accept them as being useful. We might even accept them as being true as long as they work. And those are going to be based on these man-made ideas that are able to um, explain what I cannot directly observe. And atomic theory is an example of that. So we accept atomic theory as correct as long as it works for us. As soon as it does not work, then we have to look to either change it or tweak it a little bit. So when I talk about theories, what am I talking about? A theory, and out of this particular page, this is something that is at least worthwhile to know, if not worthwhile to write down. But a theory is a set of statements that is meant to explain what I can observe and predict what I have not yet observed. So that's going to be kind of a, come, become a key thing because as soon as my theory predicts something that I, I observe something different, I need to change the theory. And I'll come back to that a little bit later. And then atomic theory is going to be the one that we're focused on. A model is the picture that we draw or the little thing that we can build. And a law is something that we know works every single time and we don't necessarily have a need to explain it. So for example, the law of gravity, I know that gravity is there. Do I know why gravity is there? I don't need to. I know that it is. Somebody might want to know why it's there and that's their issue, but it doesn't change that gravity is real. So we're going to start with Democritus or Democritus if you prefer. We don't need his background information. We don't need his dates. So if you're already writing that down, uh, you can put a little bit of a pause on there. But what he said was that everything was made of atoms. He, of course, said it in Greek, but he said that everything is made of atoms. And these things were um, the smallest pieces that were possible, and you could not break them down any further than that. And then in between those atoms was empty space and so on. He said the atoms are indestructible and that every single different kind of material, every different kind of substance had a unique atom. So for example, he said that water, because water flows and, and uh, it, to explain its properties, he envisioned that, that the particles of water, the atoms of water, were going to be spheres so they could easily roll, which would give water the ability to flow. Whereas iron as a solid always as a solid holds on to other atoms quite uh, strongly. So he had this idea of these little hooks in it. Now, that idea was challenged, even rejected by Aristotle, where Aristotle had more an idea that it wasn't so much individual particles that could not be broken down, but he was more in uh, like the idea of different characteristics. So when he talked about the elements, he wasn't thinking about the periodic table of the elements. It was more a thing about characteristics. Um, we'll look into that a little bit later, but we're not really, we don't use it anymore, so we're not going to spend the time with it. But then he had this idea about the qualities and then this idea of, of conflict and harmony. And everything moved to, to this point where it balanced its conflict and its harmony so that everything was in sort of this proper place. We don't use that anymore, so we're going to move on. But his, I don't want to call it his periodic table, but it looked like this. Now there are certain ways that this actually makes a lot of sense, or I can give you an example of things that make sense. I won't do it right now, but I could. So it wasn't like it was completely out of the blue. He actually did have some thinking behind it. However, current atomic theory always points back to John Dalton as our starting point. And in that year, which again, I'm never going to ask you the year, but just to give you a sense of timing, 
he had experimental evidence. His theory was the first one that was based on experimental evidence. So it was observable reality, observable data that he was then trying to explain with his theory. And he had these statements for his atomic theory. Now, I'm not going to go through each one of them. I do want you to pause and read them. You don't need to write them down because that's not our current modern theory. But if you were to look at that, there's a lot of things that A, look back at Democritus or Democritus if you prefer, and say, yeah, not a bad idea. B, day-to-day -day living, that works pretty well. C, all of those statements that we know now to be wrong. So none of those are correct in terms of our modern understanding. So we had to change the theory. But his Dalton model looked like that, these little marbles that never did break up. Okay, William Crookes. Now, Crookes, not so much the name William Crookes, but this is where modern atomic theory starts in terms of how did we get to the picture, the model that we have now. So what Crookes did is important. This is where you want to be taking some notes. Don't still care, still don't care about the, the date and Crookes tube, we're also going to call it, have a, a different name, it's called a cathode ray tube, but a cathode ray tube or Crookes tube looks something like this and we'll label these parts up in class. So basically what you had was a glass tube with two electrodes in it and you connected it to power. You vacuumed out the tube so there were zero atoms inside that tube. That becomes a little bit more important later. When you turned on the power, then you had these beams, these, these cathode rays, and they had these properties. Now, the thing about those beams is that this idea of a negative charge and the fact that these, uh, that it caused these pinwheels to spin suggested things about what was that beam was made of that could not be explained with what they knew about atoms at the time. So it required us to change our theory. Thompson took up that work and what he did was he explained it by saying the atom has electrons and electrons then made up the this cathode ray or these, these cathode rays in the Crookes tube were streams of electrons. And if these electrons, where did they come from? They came from the atom. So he took Dalton's model because he liked the idea of spheres, but he had to include a electron into it. So we end up with here. And again, we'll explain this and go into a little bit more detail, although we don't use this model anymore, so we don't need all of the details. But we do need to know how we discovered the electron. Ernest Rutherford tested that theory a little bit more. He was working with radiation and what he was doing was he sent beams of radioactive particles at a gold foil uh, that he thought was made of Thompson atoms. His prediction was that the particles would go straight through the atom. There wasn't really anything strong enough, big enough, heavy enough, dense enough to stop those particles. So his experiment looked a little bit like this, although I need you to, for the first part, ignore the arrows going all over the place because he didn't think they would. His prediction, based on the atom, was they would all go straight through, that there would be just a straight line from the box to the far side. What he actually got was these lines going all over the place, and we'll explain that another time. But what that meant was his prediction, based on the theory, was wrong, or the theory could not properly predict. So we had to change the atom. What he came up with was to reject the Thompson model and to and come up with this. And this is getting a whole lot closer, but now we have a nucleus in that atom. And again, we'll fill in some details another time, but for our basic timeline and our basic progression, here's where we're at. So, his two key conclusions, and this is also quite important, is the experiment that led us to understand a new thing about the atom was that the electrons were around a nucleus, and the nucleus was very heavy and very dense. That left us with what we sort of are probably most familiar with in terms of what an atom looks like. If you see this picture without having a label, you would know that it was an atom. Okay. That is as far as we're going to go here in terms of our background. We're going to pick it up pretty much right at here. We'll fill in some of the, the gaps and details on those key experiments, and then we're going to move into Bohr theory. But we'll do that in class. Talk to you later.